Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and this is our first audio podcast here on iTunes from my medical school. We'll be doing podcasts every week, as well as doing the YouTube channel as well. The subjects we cover here on the audio podcast will be different than the subjects we cover on the YouTube channel. So make sure to check out the YouTube channel every week and the audio podcast here on iTunes for your weekly medical knowledge needs. All right, let's get to today's topic. Today's topic is myeloproliferative disorders. So what are myeloproliferative disorders? Well, let's break down that word. Myelo, referring to myeloid cells. So the myeloid cells are your red blood cells, your platelets, your stromal cells, and the precursors that lead to these cells. Proliferative, meaning an increase or an expansion of. So all the myeloproliferative disorders are an expansion or increase of one of the myeloid line of cells. The myeloproliferative disorders consist of one, polycythemia vera, two, essential thrombocytosis, three, myelofibrosis, and four, chronic myeloid leukemia. So let's begin talking about polycythemia vera. Polycythemia vera is an erythroid line expansion. So you'll see an increase in the number of RBCs or red blood cells. You may see a slight leukocytosis, meaning an increase in the white blood cells, a slight thrombocytosis, increasing in platelets, but the main factor is increase in your red blood cells. Patients will commonly come to you complaining of an itching rash whenever they take a shower. You do a basic workup. You notice the hematocrit is very elevated, being greater than 60%. Now, to understand polycythemia vera, you have to understand how red blood cells are produced. They're produced by your bone marrow. One of the main hormone stimulants is called EPO, or erythropoietin. This hormone is commonly made famous by Lance Armstrong because a lot of times athletes use this to increase the red blood cells and the thought that it will increase oxygen delivery to their organs and muscles. So erythropoietin usually stimulates red blood cell production, but in polycythemia vera, you have an increase in red blood cell production independent of the erythropoietin level. So the actual erythropoietin level will be low because of negative feedback because the body is producing all these red blood cells they're feeding back onto the kidneys, telling the kidneys stop producing EPO, and you have actually a low EPO level with a high hematocrit. Now, the diagnostic criteria for polycythemia vera are one, an increase in RBC mass, so as evidenced by your increase in hematocrit, two, a normal partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries, so your arterial oxygen level should be normal. The reason why is if you have a low arterial oxygen level, that is a stimulus to your body to produce more red blood cells. So we don't want to confuse polycythemia vera with secondary causes of increase in red blood cell mass. For example, if you have COPD, your oxygen levels may be chronically lower than the norm, and thus you may have an increase in RBC mass, an increase in your red blood cells. And that would not be a case of polycythemia vera. In addition, you will also see a low erythropoietin level, as I discussed before. Other things you want to do is you want to rule out secondary causes of erythrocytosis. So like I said, things that can cause apoxia, renal disease, renal cell carcinoma, all things that can increase your RBC mass. And finally, the one other thing to look for is the JAK2 mutation. The JAK2 mutation is a tyrosine kinase mutation that can lead to polycythemia vera. In the right clinical setting of clinical polycythemia vera, if you have a JAK2 mutation, that's pathognomonic for having a diagnosis of polycythemia vera. So what do you do for the treatment of polycythemia vera? One is phlebotomy, and then two, giving them low-dose aspirin to prevent a thrombosis. With this increased RBC mass, your viscosity in your blood will be thicker, and you have increased risk of developing thrombosis. So that's why we give low-dose aspirin as well, in addition to phlebotomy. If a patient's blood pressure cannot tolerate phlebotomy, you can always try chelating agents to reduce the iron to decrease production of red blood cells as well. So now let's go to essential thrombocytosis. Essential thrombocytosis is an increase in your platelet count. You have to have a sustained increase of greater than six months to qualify for essential thrombocytosis. You must also rule out any secondary causes. So iron deficiency anemia, uh, infection as a possible cause, uh, chronic vascular disease is also a possible cause. Um, also known as central thrombocytosis, 50% of patients will have a JAK2 mutation. In terms of the treatment, treatment's mainly observation. That is, as long as there is no risk or history of stroke or cardiac disease. 
In the case of a history of stroke or cardiac disease, you can decrease the platelet count by giving hydroxyurea or busulfan. Also consider interferon alpha as well as anegrolide. Essentially what these medications do is suppress the production of your cells from your bone marrow. So they decrease the platelet count doing that way as well. Next, let's talk about idiopathic myelofibrosis. Essentially, myelofibrosis is cytopenias with fibrosis in your bone marrow. Interestingly, you'll see extramedullary hematopoiesis, meaning that because your bone marrows are no longer producing your red blood cells, the liver and spleen, which created these red blood cells when you were a fetus, are now returning to that function of creating red blood cells um, and other cells that your bone marrow was able to produce before. So you'll commonly see hepatosplenomegaly as well. On a peripheral blood smear, you'll see teardrop-shaped red blood cells and nucleated red blood cells, indicating one, that there's fibrosis, so essentially these RBCs are kind of squeezing themselves out, and nucleated red blood cells because there's a rapid expansion or hematopoiesis that's extramedullary. Um, in addition, when you try to do a bone marrow, it will be a dry tap, meaning you won't get any bone marrow out. Essentially, what it is is because there's fibrosis within the bone marrow itself, there's not a good amount of cells to actually tap. So what is the treatment for idiopathic myelofibrosis? Well, it's really supportive. Keep in mind, median survival with myelofibrosis is about five years without any transplant. Note that these patients can convert to acute leukemia. Treatment is with growth factors or you can give hydroxyurea. In the young, you can do bone marrow transplants as well and then it's really just supportive care from there on out. So this brings us to chronic myeloid leukemia. In chronic myeloid leukemia, patients are commonly present with fatigue. You may get a history of radiation exposure from them. You note they have an increased white blood cell count with an increase in the number of myelocytes though there may be some eosinophilia and basophilia present as well. For diagnosis, you look at the peripheral blood smear, you'll see large myeloid cells that have a large nuclear to cytoplasm ratio. They may be myeloperoxidase positive as well as they may have hour rods as well to give you indication these are myeloid cells. Note that, that chronic myeloid leukemia is associated with the Philadelphia chromosome, so translocation of 922. Um, this is an ABL proto-oncogene, essentially creates an abnormal tyrosine kinase. And when you have this development, you can treat these patients with the satinib or imatinib, um, and it works very well for them. You note these patients will have a hypercellular bone marrow, and their leukocyte alkaline phosphatase will actually be lower than in patients with like an acute leukemia. Note that many of these patients can transform to an acute leukemia, 80% of those that do transform go to AML, while 20% of those go to ALL. The main treatment is really bone marrow transplant, but really the hematologist and oncologist should be consulted for further intervention. So that's a, a brief review of myeloproliferative disorders. If you have any questions, make sure to just go to our YouTube channel, check out what we're talking about on the YouTube channel. You can put any comments down below about any questions about the podcast, and make sure to just come back weekly and see what we have for you. This is Dr. K from My Medical School, and I'll see you next time.